Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual office hour. My name is Cassandra McGee. I'm a senior program manager with JFF, and we are happy that you joined today's conversation. Our topic for today is models of sponsorship and it will be led by Martha Pongi, the Director of Apprenticeship with MACNI, and Stu Boss, the Principal for Progress Works. This project is um, led in part through the U.S. Department of Labor, um, Youth Apprenticeship and Intermediaries Project, and is part of our aspect for Apprenticeship Works. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Andrea messing Matthew, who is the Project Director. Andrea? Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. As Cassandra mentioned, um, this is our virtual office hours um, under our community of practice, Youth Apprenticeship Works. Um, we, this is a pilot program that we're piloting this year, really trying to figure out how we bring practitioners and partners together in a much more informal way to allow for some unique types of conversation. So today we're going to spend time with Martha and Stu talking about models of sponsorship. And um, please keep um, Youth Apprenticeship Works in mind. And um, towards the end, I think Cassandra will be able to share some information about how you can join our community of practice. Martha, can I pass it on to you? You can. So welcome to today's Youth Apprenticeship Virtual Office Hours. We are really excited to have you join us today and allow us to share information on how to launch and stand up new registered apprenticeship programs. Um, this session is meant to be conversational in nature and you will have time to ask questions, but please remember that Stu and I are only an email away and that's provided for you in the participants and at the end, if you have any questions moving forward, please don't hesitate to reach out to either one of us. So let me start off by saying something I guess I, everybody already knows that apprenticeship is always employer centered. Um, an apprenticeship program has to be flexible enough to meet the needs of a single employer or a group of employers and yet allow each participating entity to train their apprentices in the way that aligns with the competences required to be proficient at their particular business. While the US DOL and the state DOL across the nation approve the outline, they never mandate how the training is done, and they also don't mandate who you work with. So as an organization makes a decision to formally register their program and they're deciding which type of sponsorship they will be applying for, one of the very most proactive and positive things that they can do is to identify the partners in their community. Decide which services and subject matter expertise they can leverage in order to ensure their program's success. And I'll pass into Stu to give us some more information. Can we go to the next slide, Cassandra? Thank you. Stu, you're on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> my family often wishes they had one of those mute buttons. Uh, I love, welcome everybody. I look forward to uh, presenting and working with you if you uh, need some help after this presentation. This is one of my favorite slides to talk about. As you may all know, if you're involved with any type of apprenticeship activity, it's a partnership and it really requires a regional infrastructure to really make it successful and to share the burden with the employers. And this illustration here, we see how the workforce system, economic development, if there's a, a represented employer, then you have the labor organizations and the training uh, partners from K through 12 community, uh, colleges as well as four-year institutions. For recruitment on the supply side, we have the community-based organizations and the, the, and the workforce system uh, working through one stops and job centers and the state apprenticeship agencies are there to help guide you through this. So what I'd like to draw your attention to is what I think is those folks who carry the water. I'm from Philadelphia, uh, we, we call that clear liquid stuff water. But the idea here is who actually makes those meetings happen? Who is the convener? What role does each of these organizations have in the uh, in creating a robust apprenticeship for the employer as well as the partnership that supports it? 
And I'd like to draw your attention to those spokes around the, the system there in this illustration. To me, that's where the intermediaries come in. And we're going to talk about different models of uh, apprenticeships and, and how those sponsorships may look. But ultimately, the intermediaries provide a very important role in convening folks, making sure that the subject matter experts for each aspect of developing the apprenticeship or enhancing it or adding trades or identifying who the training providers may be, helping, you know, most employers are not curriculum development specialists. And, and there's also <laughs> a, a real need for building that connection between the employer and the training providers. And creating those meetings where the subject matter experts from the employers uh, work sites actually customize not just the classroom training with the related technical instruction, but also the on the job learning and to create a form formatted process for documenting all that and creating a benchmark. That's all of the work of creating the apprenticeship and that's to me the role of the intermediary to get the right people in the room or if they're the expert. Each of these organizations that you see illustrated here could be an intermediary. Martha, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, just that, you know, as we start to go through the um, different ways of registering programs, really be aware of who the partners are that can support entities and, and really keep in mind in your own community who those individuals might be. Um, I think it's going to differ from region to region and from state to state based on the, the regulations that um, exist um, within state orgs and within the USDOL, but always rely on those around you to leverage the resources that you have. I never want an employer to think they're in this on their own. They're in this with the help of many of us who are on this call today and many others that we work with on a daily basis. So I, I think we can go to slide to your, two, Cassandra. Oh, go ahead. I just have something to your point there. You mentioned about individuals. Ultimately, everybody, you need your champion in each of the organizations that you work with. And that'll become more apparent as we go through the next few slides. But those relationships are really critical for, to help make the meetings happen. And when you think of how much it takes to have a meeting, how many emails that go out and how many phone calls it's it's quite a bit but it's well worth doing back to you martha all right so registered apprenticeship sponsors can be single businesses um alternatively the sponsor can be a consortium of businesses um a workforce intermediary such as an industry association my association is the manufacturers association of central new york we've been um, a group sponsor for five years, and um, we work all across the state of New York. Um, or it could be a labor management organization. Um, in some states, community colleges and community-based organizations also serve as sponsors of apprenticeship programs. Um, in the instance that employers are registered through a group sponsor, um, they're referred to as signatory companies. And I think that that's a word sometimes comes up in, in the vernacular and people go, what's that? So when you're registered within a group, those, those employers are all called your signatory companies. Um, sponsors roles, they're generally responsible for the management of a program. They ensure that the apprentices have access to the appropriate OJT and the related instruction necessary to complete the apprenticeship program and obtain that journey worker card. They're also that main point of contact for the USDOL or for a state agency. So you know, we're gonna go through um, four examples as we move on to the next um, slides. But I think that, um, again, it depends regionally, it depends in which state you are, but think about all of the multiple businesses, the workforce systems, the association, which one is most applicable in your region? You don't always have to do it like the guy next door. You do it in the best way that supports employers in your region. I think we can go to the next slide. Um, I think probably this is um, the, the one type of apprenticeship that most of us are most 
recognizing is that individual business sponsor. And traditionally, large businesses have been the sponsors of their own programs. And the reason that large businesses tended to be the sponsors of their program is because they had the sufficient internal resources to manage those programs. And very often they had enough um, apprentices in their organization to achieve an economy of scale when they were doing things like trying to buy related technical instruction. Um, large businesses always tended to have the financial resources to bring in specialized training and support expenses that are associated with the loss of productivity from having your journey workers train. And even if no outside funding was available, I think that this individual business sponsor, while it is still extremely relevant, um, it doesn't tend to be the norm as it used to be. I think as we start to grow registered apprenticeship, especially youth apprenticeship across our country, we tend to see more of um, the other three types of apprenticeship that are utilized. Stu? I guess uh, one of the ways we can identify the roles of each of these cards in the mm -hmm. years here, the business has the relationship with the community college as developing the RTI, the curriculum. And then the workforce system yeah. Can, not, uh, can help with recruitment, but it can also help with offsetting some of the costs for apprenticeship. The Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act has provided a lot of resources for supporting apprentices, including the individual training accounts, uh, on-the-job training contracts, and uh, can help with offset re uh, off other expenses, including wages with on-the-job <laughs> training contracts. So it's a real good idea for helping create this system when you're in the region and you know that there's a large business starting an apprenticeship. You can go to the next slide, Cassandra. <laughs> um, it's the group sponsorship is becoming one of the, the most popular um, types of sponsorship that is being utilized across the country. And the reason is, is that when multiple businesses come together to sponsor an apprenticeship, it allows them to share the burden of some of the things like OJT. When one of us has, you know, a subject matter expert who is really, you know, leading, uh, able to be that leader in a training, we can share them across businesses. When a particular career and technical school has been providing um, related technical instruction for a group sponsor, it's easier for us in the business when the businesses come together to disseminate that knowledge to all of the businesses that are participating and really give them access to all of the services that each of the businesses is utilizing in order to lift up and make sure that their program. Um, is successful. Um, when multiple businesses come together, it allows us again to build an economy of scale so that very small organizations, and, and I will talk to about just an example in New York State, is that we work with the independent service centers of New York State. And there are about 1,200 different automotive stations that only have three to four employees. So as they are starting to lift up their apprenticeship program, all of those businesses came together and they decided to utilize a particular type of training because when 1,200 people were purchasing, it was a 10th of the cost. When 1,200 um, people were deciding what RTI to provide and or what OJT was most um, important to them, they all came together. It allowed everybody to have a voice. Any other things about group sponsorship that you want to add, Stu? Well, I mean, when you think about this, Martha, with the multiple businesses coming together, it's usually like an industry association like mm -hmm. yours. Yeah. Uh, a chamber of commerce. I've seen a chamber of commerce step up to the plate to be the sponsor. And we could talk about the responsibilities of the sponsor if that becomes of interest. 
But when you think about leading the um, initiative for a new sponsorship, the career and technical school can have a, a lot of say in that. And that's where this is really uh, um, an alignment or uh, actually uh, I'm trying to figure out the right word where everybody is helping to make it happen and provides leadership concerning their own domain of yeah. expertise. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it really, it, it becomes quite a dynamic and ultimately it will need to be facilitated. So in some ways the industry association may not have the curriculum per se uh, or the recruitment access and that's where the other organizations that come into the group sponsorship can uh, really provide a lot of leadership. Just to get um, the dynamic. I think bit. if we go to the next slide, Cassandra, so this is industry associations and um, you'll see we've added that cog to our, um, our graphic. So we still have multiple businesses, but now we've added an industry association into the mix. And as Stu said, one of the things that an industry association can do is to be the convener of, as an association, um, especially in manufacturing, you have access to all of the employers. Most of them are in your membership. A lot of times, uh, industry associations um, have both industrial and non-industrial members. So those community colleges, those K through 12 programs, very often are having discussions with those industry associations on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So there's a dissemination of information that doesn't always happen when a single business tries to approach someone like a community college. Interestingly enough, um, it's really only in the last 10 years that industry associations really have started to become sponsors or when it's become sort of norm for an industry association to be a sponsor. It's a great choice for regions that are sponsoring multiple trades at multiple different companies because associations generally have access to multiple industry sector employees, the community colleges, community-based organizations, which we haven't really even talked about, that can help support the multiple needs of different employers. One might have a problem getting their employees to work because they're a very rural employer. That community-based org, I might know about it as an industry association person and be able to share that information across low-cost car loans, uh, bus routes that are being developed to support employers, things like that. Um, we, we very often aggregate training for very small businesses that are challenged by the need for a particular type of training and the cost prohibitiveness of just having one or two employees that want to take that training. Um, the other thing I think that the industry associations do really, really well is they are sort of a voice of the employer. So that labor market data that's available is really on an anecdotal basis. So it's not like reading a report that comes from the Department of Labor every week you're hearing directly from an employer what their pain points are, what their challenges are. And so I think that that's one of the reasons that we have seen associations really become as popular as they are because they, they really can just can bring all of those things to the table and make sure that they are working to support all of the other members of the, um, of the org but also helping to drive that success, which is really what the employers need and what those apprentices need. Do anything I, else on industry? I have a question for you, Martha. Yep. How would you summarize the responsibilities for the industry association as a sponsor? So I think there's two different things that we could talk about. Um, some industry associations really just act as an intermediary and really do that convening of and sharing of information. They bring people together on a regular basis, maybe provide advisory boards, um, work with the community colleges. My organization actually acts as an industry association group sponsor. So as a group sponsor in an association, I take on the responsibilities that a single employer would have. So making sure that each and every 
um, apprentice has access to um, the proper OJT, making sure they have access to related technical instruction that's appropriate for each and every apprentice. Because as an industry association, right now I currently have about 90 active apprentices. Not all of them want to go directly into terminal degrees. Some of them want to do certificate programs. Some of them want to do online training to bring their skill sets up to a place where they feel comfortable. I have to be able to manage all of that as well as a group sponsor and be directly responsible to the Department of Labor for the success of a program. So there's did a couple you, of different models. Yeah, go ahead. Did you, uh, you registered the program, right? Yes, we did. So that means you also have to be, you're responsible for documenting the apprentices of progress. Absolutely. Were you, were you involved with customizing the work processes for each of the participating employers? What did that look we like? Did. We did. Um, we worked with um, specific focus groups as we um, started to sponsor sp specific trades. We would bring in five to 10 employers and go through the whole outline and make changes that um, were applicable generally to the group and specifically to a few of the organizations. And we were able to work with the Department of Labor in New York State to make sure that we had the ability to add miscellaneous topics and or delete things that were not appropriate and sort of exchange them. And that's like in New York State, it's about a 10% allowance of those kinds of things. But we, when we brought all of those people to the table together, it gave very small businesses the same voice that it gave to very large businesses. And that doesn't always happen. And I think, again, that's one of the values that you see in group sponsorship is, you know, it's not always um, the person with the most apprentices that, that has, you know, the most influence. It's really the people with the subject matter expertise and the experience working with apprenticeship that really drive what the employers need. Um, we're on to labor organizations, and I know, Sue, you've had a, t a ton of experience working with a lot of groups across the country. Thank you. Um, when we think of the original um, dynamic of, of uh, apprenticeships, it's based on the experience with the building trades. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, a lot of folks think, well, it's the uh, IBW electrical workers or the carpenters program. It's actually a labor management governed program. And it's a group sponsorship because you have in the, uh, those cases of the building trades, it was a local and then all the represented employers that have collective bargaining agreements with that local would then create a separate uh, form of governance and funding that is separate from the membership dues to be their apprenticeship. And it's usually called a joint apprenticeship and training council. And you have a board of trustees that oversees the program that's labor management. So even though a labor organization may become a sponsor, it still has uh, the employers are part of the governance and mm -hmm. customizing of the program. What we're seeing now is in, when we move into non-traditional industries, such as even manufacturing is now considered almost traditional, but if you talk <laughs> about food processing or public sector, a labor organization can still be a sponsor. I'm working with the steel workers here in Philadelphia, and they have actually 50 uh, employers that are represented by their local. About four of them are in the same industry of packaging, and as you can imagine, they are a real need for workers right now, particularly with the distribution of the vaccines and the way the you know cardboard boxes are actually becoming precious. So we're starting a, an apprenticeship where the labor union is actually the convener. They're the ones that's bringing in all the subject matter experts to customize the program because the employers, you know, they're focused on production and distribution. And, and if you think about any industry sector, those employers are focused on whatever services or products they manufacture or provide. So I'm going to keep it short because it'd be good if we had some time for questions and answers. Yeah. But I just wanted to let you know that this is another opportunity for group sponsorship with the labor mm -hmm. uh, organization in the lead. It still has the same dynamics with the employers and as well as the training providers and the workforce system. 
So Cassandra and or Martha, did you want to add anything or? Um... No, I will tell you that, you know, um, we have um, some smaller employers that that do have labor representation, but not enough to have their own program. So they have actually joined into some of the industry associations. So yeah, while a labor union may be a sponsor, they also may participate in a regular group sponsor or you know their employer may have their own program. And we've seen that happen as well. So there's a question in the chat. Um, it says, mm -hmm. can a workforce system ever be a sponsor? Is that you, Patricia? That's Hi, good afternoon. Yes, it is. Hi, Patricia. Go ahead. You can answer. Um, I can't tell you in other states. I know in New York State, they cannot be. Okay. Well, I can tell you this. In, in Philadelphia, the workforce board has stepped up to take a lead in the uh, promoting apprenticeship as a workforce strategy. And there's actually five different workforce boards in Southeast Pennsylvania that are participating in what's called apprenticeship PHL after the airport, where they really created a clearinghouse and have hosted um, symposiums. So there's a really important role. Now I heard in New Jersey that there are, the workforce boards could become a sponsor, but I, I, I wonder sometimes about capacity for any organization to step up and do all those responsibilities on such a micro way that it, whether a workforce board, whether it would be in, within its mission to do that or to help promote another sponsor. So Patricia, you're in uh, Florida, correct? I am. Okay. And so I believe that there are I some boards in that in Florida. I'm sorry, you, you cut out at the last part. Yes, I believe that there are some boards that have um, become program sponsors in Florida. Um, That's I, correct, Cassandra. Yes. There Is are, that? Yeah, we, we've worked with a few down there that have opted to create their own or be their own sponsors and work with employers to uh, basically remove the burden from the employers and take on uh, mm -hmm. the operation and management side of it. Um, so, Patricia, I think that's a really great question anyways, because I think it goes back to that original slide. You have, a, you know, a whole group of partners that are in your region. And I think, again, in support of an employer, you want to do everything you can to make this a seamless process for that employer, to make it as easy as he can to get his product out the door and or the service that they provide, if you're in healthcare, things like that. If there is someone else who is equipped to help carry some of that burden, it's always a really great idea to have them included. That's that whole leveraging resources. Some of us are just much better equipped to do things. I have, um, as I said, you know, I have about um, 90 apprentices right now. I have about 50 different businesses and I can tell you very, um, very, um, I guess, honestly, that there are about three that are rock stars. They could run my program, their program, and 10 others because it's just, it's in their DNA. They're really good at that process thing. They, the reporting comes naturally. Others, you know, it's, it's a struggle to have someone who can get a blue book together in a week. So again, leveraging resources and deciding who in your community is best able to support some of these um, challenges and move it forward. It's all about working together. Partnerships 101 is, is what is really making apprenticeships successful across the nation. Well, thank you so much, um, Martha and Sue, for leading a very engaging and informative conversation about models of sponsorship. Um, and it does vary, I, um, I know, state by state regarding mm -hmm. who is at the table for um, program sponsorship. Um, JFF, we did um, lead a um, technical assistance for the state of Florida. So there are boards that oh, did wow. step 
order mm -hmm. to become sponsors mm -hmm. in the state of Florida. And Steve and Jerry through IAA were involved in those conversations and in helping actually stand up those programs. So if anybody wants further information about Florida or anything else, please feel free to email me. We'll connect you to resources and those that can help you beyond that as well as um, connect if you have further information to Martha and to Stu. Um, so these um, sessions are recorded and they will be available in our community of practice along with other resources regarding youth apprenticeship um, and then being able to connect to other webinars and technical assistance that we provide. If you would like to have this session recorded because I've already received one email prior to it being posted in our community of practice, please feel free to email me there. Uh, my email is there. So Andre, would you like to have anything to say before we close out the session today? No, just thank you very much for joining us and please spread the word about these virtual office hours um, and please join us on the community practice. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thank you.